Okay, are you ready? There we go. What color is that? <laughs> Maybe if we take a pencil. And then we make a face. And then we see the life in the eyes. Life is always in the eyes. <gasps> There's our monster. How does the story begin? Was a boy. Too old. To be a kid. You're coming to live with me. Don't touch anything. Too young to be a man. I no longer see you. <laughs> what did he do? You have to face this, but you have to be brave. Do you understand? What shall I destroy next? Break the windows! Break them yourself. It's okay that you're angry. I'm angry too. And if you need to break things, by God, you break them. Hundred years I could give to you. I'm afraid. Of course you are afraid. But you will make a thrill. For this is why you called me. Come on. Give it up one more time for one of the most beautiful films of the year. Congratulations, guys. <laughs> I saw it yesterday morning. I, I can only ask you guys questions. I, I don't want to talk about it too much because I might start crying again. I, I think I, I cried more yesterday morning than I have in a long time. So thank you for that. Um, let's talk about how this story originated, Patrick. I know that it was originally told by uh, a woman by the name of Shaban who actually had was terminally ill when she originated the story, and then you wrote the book based on her story? Right, really, yeah, really unusual place to begin. Siobhan Dowd is, uh, was a absolutely fantastic writer for teenagers, and she wrote four really wonderful books, but she did write them all knowing that she had breast cancer and that it was terminal, and A Monster Calls was intended to be her fifth, and she fully expected to be able to write it, and she started out, uh, there was about a thousand words of her first chapter and a structural idea about, the, about storytelling, and then sadly she died before she could really begin, and we showed an editor at the time, and the editor didn't want the idea to vanish, because um, she thought it was such a good one, and she brought it to me and asked if I would turn it into a book. So a ex very, very unusual way for a novel to start, and um, that's how we began. Well, what's that like for you as a, as a novelist, sort of taking somebody else's work that way and trying to sort of, at the same time, maintain their spirit and their tone, but also just writing yourself? Yeah, I mean, I, my first reaction was actually to say no. I thought, well, I mean, I worried that a good story doesn't get written that way. It's got to be uh, a story first. It's got, it can't be a tribute or a memorial, because mostly because that's not what she would have written. She was so intelligent and mischievous and sparky. And, but her idea was so potent, even though small, that um, it immediately started suggesting other ideas, uh, including in the key scene of the film was the first idea I got where um, Connor finally expresses his anger uh, by destroying a living room. And, uh, and I thought, there's power here. There's, real, there's really something here that, we can, that, that can be built on. So that's why I did purely the idea. And that's what's so interesting to me about the film is that it is, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, the story of a child, but in many ways it's walking a very thin, tight rope between an adult film and a film for children. Uh, Jay, can you talk about walking that tight rope, how powerful you wanted it to be? It is a film about loss. It is a film about death and, 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 and overcoming that or coming to terms with that. And that is quite heavy for, for, for a children's film at times. Well, I mean, the first time I read the book, I was so impressed uh, because that it's so rare to find nowadays this kind of material, a fantasy film, but 
dealing with childhood in such a serious way, with so much respect, and it reminds me a lot of movies that I saw when I was a kid, like uh, E.T. or The NeverEnding Story. And this e. is always the touchstone for like a, a fantasy film about children that is also heavy and beautiful at the same time. And, and emotional and, 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 and has a depth that is so rare to find nowadays, this kind of material, that when I read the book, I, I had an immediate reaction to it, and, I, and I, wanted to, I wanted to do it from the very first moment. Were you nervous at all about, uh, about, about walking that tightrope? Um, not really. I mean, I, I, I came from shooting a couple of films, uh, The Orphanage and The Impossible, that were dealing with the same kind of themes. Um, they were pretty successful, so, so I, I, I thought <laughs> somehow I, I would you be able to... You were confident. I was kind of confident, yeah. But then it's, it's through that suddenly you start to try to find out the way to put uh, the story that, from Patrick in, in the, on, on the screen, and it was quite um, challenging. You know, it's a, it's a film... Uh, with so many different subject matters and a layer of fantasy and reality with such an emotional level. And it was quite challenging, the stories inside the story that we tell using animations, but very rewarding when you see the movie with, a, with an audience and you see the, the reaction they have watching it. Louis, uh, you're doing work in this film as an actor that I think sort of veteran actors would shy away from doing in terms of how emotional you have to be scene, scene by scene. Uh, what was it like for, for you on set shooting this movie every day? Well, I would say it's definitely quite tough. I mean, uh, when I was told I actually got the part, to be honest, I was maybe slightly nervous or, or scared even because, well, I hadn't done anything like that before. In fact, I'd only done one film before this. And yes, I was definitely quite nervous. Um, I wasn't sure whether I could you know, reach those levels of emotion that are, that are reached uh, during the film. But, you know, during shooting, I was, I was obviously very lucky to be surrounded by a great cast and a great director. And, and yeah, I mean... And a great screenplay. And a great, and a great writer <laughs> as well, yeah. Um, but all in the writing. It all starts with <laughs> the writing. <laughs> yeah, but um, often on set, you know, um, Jay would often use music, you know, a lot of music to try and help me get into... into those sort of zones, and I found that actually extremely helpful. Can I ask Jay what kind of music you, you used? It depends on of the, of the scene. Uh, there were moments that were pretty emotional, so we were playing this kind of Ennio Morricone music. But then rem I remember shooting with the bullies. We were playing a lot of uh, hip hop, things that makes the kid feel cooler and harder and stronger. Patrick, uh, talk to me about adapting the book into a movie. I mean, this is definitely like three different forms of adaptation that you're doing at this point in terms of taking the original story and adapting it into sort of how you would tell it and then it, taking that and adapting it into a film for J.A. to direct. Uh, yeah, mostly it's, um, it, mostly it's sort of stubbornness and spite. I mean, I think spite and defiance are a great way to do any kind of writing. And I, 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 agree. Felt, I felt like I wanted to, I felt like I knew, I felt like I, I felt like I knew why the story worked and I felt, um, very much a caretaker position because of Siobhan. I felt really, really protective of it and very protective of the work of Jim Kay, the illustrator as well. It felt like the three of us in this book. And I thought I've, I have to protect what we've, what we've done and, and what Siobhan intended. And so early on in the filmmaking process, we would get some suggestions early on from uh, way before I met Jay uh, about ways to maybe soften the material. Could we make it just a little bit easier? And I thought, well, that's, that's not true. That's not right. And so I thought, um, I'll write it myself just to start the conversation. I don't know that I'm right about these things. I'm not a filmmaker, but I'd like to at least say this is what I believe in, and this is what I think works and is strong, and then see if somebody responds. And I was very, very lucky that um, Bioma did. There is a truth to the film that is in, at, at the least incredibly impressive that you're able to pull off in a movie that has so many special effects and clearly was, you know, very well budgeted. It, to go the places that you go is so impressive. Was that difficult for you to sort of pull off as a director and, and as the writer in the early stages? Were there conversations that had to be had about how far you could take the story, how, not sad, but how, how dark you could, you could go? Yes, very difficult, especially uh, all the, um, the visual effects aspect. I mean, this is not a visual effects movie. It's more like a drama. Uh, but we have a character that is uh, 40 feet tall. So when you have a character that is that big and it's a monster that looks like a tree, uh, you really need to be careful in the tone. I think it was quite challenging to find the tone of the film. There's moments that you can have as very intimacy scenes with the mother and the kid, 
and in the next scene we have big epic animations. So we, we had to be very careful in, in finding the tone. How did you work with Liam Neeson to sort of maintain that tone as the monster? Uh, well, I, we, we spent two weeks shooting uh, the motion capture at the beginning on, of, the, of our shooting. So that was very Is good. Is he doing motion capture, Liam Neeson? Exactly, yeah. We, oh, wow. we spent 10 days doing motion capture. We did the film, all the scenes with the monster, several times. And he played always the monster in front of Louis. So for Louis, it was also like a great help having uh, Liam playing the monster. Oh, I had no idea. I thought that he was, uh, I thought he was just the voice at times. That's amazing that he was doing motion capture. Yeah, and it was very, very impressive to see him playing the, the monster. Uh, the level of subtlety, it, it, uh, there's a moment at the end, we're, gonna, we're not going to tell the end of the film, but there's a mo very emotional moment at the end, and he did so, so, so he did, made, did it so little, so few things in there, but so emotional, and, and it's amazing how the animators and, and the visual effects guys can capture that performance and put it on the, on the final result. Louis, I mean, you know, I, I, it's kind of the same question that I asked you the first time, and I, I, I hate to repeat myself, but it's not even the fact that you're doing this all the time with other actors in real locations, even though there are real locations. I'd imagine there's so many special effects around you, and there's so much make-believe, actual make-believe that you have to do, and then at the same time, you have to be incredibly emotional in a very realistic way. And this is only your second film, as you said. That's Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, obviously, it's quite hard to... Well, it's easier when you've got, actually got a real person there to, to act with when you're, when you're acting. You know, it's definitely harder to act towards something that's not really there. But what they did do is they built a... They had, like, a monster's face. Like, and so it's not all completely CGI. You know, there, there was real stuff there. They had a monster's face. They had, they had a hand and they had feet. And so that was really helpful for me to have there. Like, a realistic, you know, full-scale monster's face there. Something that I helped me visualize, you know, the monster there and... That along with either um, you know like the acting coach reading the lines or even sometimes a recording of Liam um, that would just, you know allowed me to to do it. Have you been able to have you have you watched the film since since you made it? Uh, yeah, I've watched it a couple of times. Yeah. What's it like watching yourself do this performance? It's inc it's just incredibly emotional. Yeah, I mean when you're actually making the film and you know you experience every single scene and 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 you know you get something from it, but it's when you actually go to see it all put together, and I know this is said a lot, but I mean, it's just, it's just, you know, it was, it was quite, it was quite, I, I felt quite uh, proud, really, not just, you know, for, for me, but what everybody who was involved in the film had accomplished. I mean, it's so many different, different parts to it. You know, there's the visual effects and, and you know, the crew and ev and everybody. I mean, it was, it was really uh, good to see it. You absolutely should be proud. It's an incredible achievement. Jay, I, I'm, I'm curious, you know, as you said, the films that you made before this kind of helped you come to this film in terms of uh, The Orphanage and, and, and The Imp Impossible, excuse me, uh, in terms of special effects and, and family dynamics and, and, and tragedy. Uh, when, it, when it came to this, I mean, how often do you find it's that... It's not quite as bleak as it sounds. It is, it's, 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 it's a very sad film. But I don't think it's at all bleak. I think it ends. I think it ends hopeful. There is some tragedy in it, but I think I think it ends really, really hopefully. And I think it's all about getting to, as Bayan always says, it's all about getting to the light. Yeah. And I think I think we really do get to the light at the end of it. And it's about how can you survive going through a difficult thing, and how can you live the rest of your life. Absolutely. So sorry, yeah. to, sorry about in there. I I apologize if I made it sound bleak. I really didn't mean to. <laughs> um, but I, I'm curious, how often do you find as a filmmaker who clearly wants to work in the fantasy? genre, but in the fantasy genre with depth, how often do you find that something like this comes across, comes your way? I mean, I imagine you get pitches after the first couple of films that you made, you got pitches for special effects movies and fantasy films all the time, but how often do you find that any of them have the kind of depth that something like this has? Well, it's, it's very rare. Uh, look, at the, look at the movies out there. It's, it's, this film is so unique. There, it's, they, they don't make these movies anymore, so this is why I wanted to do one of these films. I really, I think the way also, uh, the story tells us how we need fantasy to understand reality. I consider the film like a love letter to fantasy. And it's true that we need fantasy. We need stories. We need uh, fiction to understand reality because reality is all about information. And, th and there's, no, there's no knowledge in information. It's such a different thing, uh, information from knowledge. And knowledge, we, we take that from, from the stories. We, we learn a lot about our, ourselves watching, uh, uh, reading, watching stories. And we know a lot about the world we live in. We learn uh, empathy as well. Exactly. Uh, and I think that it's so rare to find a fantasy material nowadays that you can feel that sense of empathy and, 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 and that level of emotion. And the, 
um, the way Patrick describes the psychology, the psychology of a kid uh, going through a very specific and difficult moment in his life. And at the same time, it's a movie about growing up and how we understand when we grow up that things can be black and white at the same time. And we live in a world nowadays that truth matters less and less. And everyone is telling us all the time, yeah, people laugh always when I say I'm that, but <laughs> you know what I'm talking, right? Yeah, it's, like, it's just like a don't get me started. I, I, I'll take so, this over. <laughs> and, 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 and nowadays, everyone is telling you things are black or white, you know, and, and, and that's not true. And for a kid, growing up, knowing that, uh, uh, feels like a cheat. But it's that way of, uh, that's part of growing up. And, and I think it's very important to send this message nowadays. Patrick, I want to talk to you about how the film isn't that bleak and finding the light in the story. Well, because I think for, to a certain degree, in order to find that light, which the film does uh, throughout the movie, as well as uh, by the end, you have to go yeah, fairly yeah, bleak. And, yeah. you have to, and that's something that is still so impressive to me about the film, is that it really cares, and the story, it cares deeply about the troubles of these characters to the point where it is sometimes shocking, but then the light is even, gra is, is, is even more gratifying. Exactly. In fact, that's what I was thinking that when you were talking about, um, you were saying sort of dark for a kid's film. In a way, it's, it's kind of not. It's kind of um, kids really, really like dark stories, uh, really, really like them. And if, oh, I always say that all you have to do is read what fiction teenagers write, the stories they write themselves, far darker than anything I'd ever be allowed to publish, ever. <laughs> And so I think... There's I a lot going on in there. With a lot go and, it, and it should. You know, it's about pushing a boundary. It's about finding taboos. It's about, um, you know, where, where do my values stop? And that, that's, it's, it's the right time to do it. So I think that the, the immoral choice is not to, um, uh, you know, pretend that there is no darkness. But it's, it, it, rather, that's the immoral choice, to pretend that there is no darkness. The, I, to me, the better thing is to say... Yes, I acknowledge that you are thinking these difficult, tough things. So let's talk about them. Let's tell the truth about them. So that when I can, t I tell the truth about um, what is light and what is possible and what is hopeful and um, what can be reached, then I'm more believed because I haven't lied um, about what is what is difficult. And that, God, that's all I wanted when I was 13, 14. I just wanted someone to say, okay, yeah, I know things are tough. Um, so let's not pretend they're not. But here's here are plenty of good reasons of how things are going to get better. Do you find it difficult to, uh, to strike that balance or sort of be able to go to those places in, in, in children's literature uh, because it's a little bit more of a balancing act? Or do you feel like you have even more freedom within that genre? You, I think you have more freedom. I think because there's, there, there is no subject that can't be discussed. It's all about how you discuss it. And, uh, and how you discuss it is essentially any story. So I just take that as a storytelling, not limitation, just you know, a direction. Uh, and young readers, they, it, the story has to work, it ha the plot has to work, everything has to you know, go somewhere. Um, but if you do that, and if you respect their point of view, then they're willing to follow you pretty much anywhere. And the boundaries between what's fantastical and what's realistic, supposedly realistic, are much easier to cross. And that's so exciting as a storyteller, and so exciting to see on film. Oh, absolutely. Uh, Lewis, you have some incredible scenes with uh, Sigourney Weaver, Felicity Jones. What was it like working with them? Well, I mean, Obviously, it was, uh, it was an honor to work with them. I mean, and only my second film I'm working with such, you know, amazing, like, actors and actresses. And, yeah, I think, you know, I really did learn, like, so much just from, you know, being around them and getting to experience their work. You know, and I think, you know, for the whole film, that's, like, an experience that I'll never be replicated um, in, in my life. I mean, I learned so much just from doing this, this one film, and... Um, you know, I feel honored to have had the opportunity to work with people like that. Jay, how tough was uh, casting uh, Lewis's part? Uh, I'd imagine, I mean, he's, as he said, he's only done one film before, and the weight of the movie is on his shoulders. He pulls it off beautifully, but it, it literally is a feature film that is, a very emotional feature film that is on his shoulders. Well, it was uh, such an important piece of the process. Uh, we did an amazing audition. We saw hundreds of kids. But it was so obvious that Louis was uh, different from the other ones from the very first time we see him. It was uh, funny because we did, um, very interesting, we did an audition uh, with a very emotional scene. And he was, uh, in, those, in, 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 that, in those auditions, he was always reluctant to cry. He was the only kid that didn't cry. Huh. And he, he was m more about rage. And there was something also 
very special is that all the kids, uh, that, was a very mo that was a very emotional scene with his, with his mother. Uh, and all the kids were, were kind of telling her, please don't go, please don't go, I want you to stay. Because it's a film about a mother dying. And, and he was saying all the time, thank you, thank you, thank you. That was so emotional, so unique. And that rage, so special that I knew from the very first moment that he was a kid. I have to ask, since you said that, what was it like to have to watch hundreds of audition tapes of children crying? <laughs> no, I, I, I must say that most of the, most of the, most of the tapes were self-tapes where they were not crying. And then, I, and then we started to work with them personally, not, not with all of them. And only at the very end, we, we were doing that emotional side. Yeah, so it's, it's less watching kids cry than making them cry. <laughs> it's, yes. right. Louis, where do you think that instinct came from when you were doing the audition to, to sort of not be the one to cry, but to, be, to, to sort of take over it with a little more rage? Um, well, to be honest, I'm, I'm not sure if I can really answer that. I don't, I don't really know, know where that came from, I guess. Um, just like any actor, like, I try to use experiences in my own life to try and help me understand what, like, what Connor was going through and things like that. So I guess it's really, you know, about things I've experienced in my own life and maybe times where I felt angry that I felt that was the right emotion, if, if you know what I mean. Uh, let's turn it over to the audience for some questions. Who has questions out there? Hey, um, so I was wondering about the, the special effects and uh, how the design of the, the monster actually came up and, uh, like, the company behind it that was working on it? Well, uh, because it was a drama, more than a, uh, more than a visual effects driven film, uh, we were trying all the time to keep the um, visual effects very grounded. We recreated um, a real life size replica of the head and both arms and one feet. So we have that real stuff that um, Louis was able to act in front of it all the time and touch real stuff. Uh, all these um, textures from the real monster were the ones we used for the CGI character. So uh, all of that kept the creature, um, the monster grounded. Also the fact that uh, we love the design of Jim Kay, the illustrator from the book, and it was so simple um, that, that in that simplicity I found, it, I found something very powerful somehow. That, that we did a lot of designs and the more we were adding to the monster, uh, the more we were apart from the from the design in the book, it was less powerful. So so we kept this idea of keeping the the monster grounded and very simple. Next question. Hey, I was wondering if you've ever written like fan fiction or spec script or something else in someone else's voice, or how you figured out how to do that, not just honorably but in general. Do you write? Is that a question? Are you a writer? Yes. So that, I've, I've never done I've never done fanfic. I have done. This was actually a spec script. I didn't have anybody attached to it because I, I didn't, like I said, I wanted to be the first person to speak, as you say, uh, for the script to say, um, let's maybe begin here if I'm lucky enough. But uh, voice is a funny old thing. It's, it's, uh, I think, especially when I started writing, when, you know, it was when I was a kid, I think the very, very first writing is mimicry. And I think that is as it should be. It's, it's you know, I'm copying the stories I read and, and um, that's kind of what fan fiction is. And that, to me, is how you learn absolutely everything. And then <clears throat> I, you know, I, 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 I like fan fiction. I think it's, you know, I think it's uh, I, the way that people respond and the way that people want to take your story and make it their own. That's absolutely amazing. Uh, I still would like to read new stuff. I'd still like to read, you know, your own idea. So don't be afraid. Just leap over that. Leap over that little boundary. I bet you can do it. If you can do fan fiction, absolutely you can. Um, find your own voice and tell a new story. That's what I'd love to read. Next question. We're going to take our final question. Fan, fan fiction is all about shagging. So much of it is all about, you know, them having sex with them. And, you know, and, and uh, I mean, the, have you seen the Harry Potter stuff? Wow. <laughs> it's every combination. So, yeah, so maybe a little less of that. We'll take our final question from an online viewer. Uh, so, Jamie would like to know which scene did you film the most takes for? I think it's um, the last scene of the film. Uh, I'm not going to tell you what is that. But I'm going to tell you that Louis didn't have any idea what we were doing in that scene because I rip off that, that scene from his script. So it's basically Connor discovering something uh, behind the door. Uh, and he didn't know what was behind, behind that door. Uh, so I thought it was very interesting to be ready with my... We shot the last scene the last day. So having our cameras prepared, uh, 
to record uh, Louis discovering what, what was behind that door that was a secret for, for him during all the shooting was very special. And to, to keep that sense of reality, it was something very, very special to see. Is that why that, that see, it's, it's kind of, uh, when we see it initially, it's in a wide shot, you sort of set up in the back and let him kind of come in and we get to capture that? Yeah. Oh, wow. Uh, talk about shooting that scene. Obviously, we, again, can't say what it is, <laughs> but what, what that was like to have that surprise. I mean, like, like, um, like Jay said, you know, he ripped that page out of my script and, you know, for the film, you see, you know, Connor looking at that door and just, and just wondering what was behind it. And, well, you know, I was wondering as well. So that was, that was really helpful. I mean, it was, when I eventually, you know, did open it, it was a, it was a great, um, great surprise. And, you know, I, I felt it really did help having that, you know, mystery in my own mind as well, you know. We shot that scene with, um, with music all the time in big speakers, uh, and it was so funny because there was a moment I wanted to call my ID to tell him something, and he was so crying, he cried so much, and suddenly I, I turned back and uh, the whole crew was crying in that moment. It was the last day of shooting, playing that music in the last scene of the film, which is, I think, is a very beautiful scene. <laughs> it was so funny, everyone crying in there, and I was trying to call the, my ID, and my ID is just looking <laughs> like that. It was your, you, so you shot the last scene on the last day, and the crew cried with you? The crew was crying? I, I could imagine that. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think that also, you know, added to the, to the emotion of that scene, the fact that, you know, because we were shooting for how long? I'd, it was like, how long were you shooting for? About um, 20 minutes, something like that. We, we, have a, we had a take. That no, I mean, like the whole film, how long? Oh, the whole film was 16 weeks. Yeah, so I mean, like, it was like, it was, you know, it was quite long. And, and I think, you know, I was at that point, you know, I was, it was quite emotional because it was the end of a, of a really, you know, big thing in my life. You know, that was a big event, you know, that, that, that whole shooting of the film. So definitely having that, you know, it's over feeling um, definitely added to, to the emotion of that scene. Well, guys, uh, the film is, in, is incredible. The story is beautiful. Uh, thank you so much for coming here and talking about it and, and for making it. I'm looking forward to seeing it again. Uh, when can people see the film? When is it coming out, guys? The film is coming out on the 23rd of December, uh, limited, uh, and then it goes wide on the 6th of January. Go see it. It's one of the most beautiful films of the year. Thank you so much for being Thank here. You. Thanks, Thank guys. You. Thank you.